For the basics of working with color in OpenTunes, I'm going to talk about three main sections. Uh, first, this section will introduce how to add color in the first place. Next, we'll take a closer look at the settings for the fill tool. And finally, we'll do a section on troubleshooting. I should also note, these demos will be for using color in Tunes vector levels. There's more on that back in part nine if you haven't seen it. I've heard some people insist on using raster levels for color, but I'm a big fan of vectors for their flexibility to keep editing lines after color has been applied. So let's jump in and add some color. <clears throat> I've opened this demo file from a previous tutorial, and what we're going to work with today is the level palette here at the bottom of the interface, and then the style editor right next to it. If you don't see this content in your level palette and style editor, make sure that you have a current level active. Uh, for example, here in the X sheet, if I click on a blank cell, that means I have no current level and no content in my level palette or style editor. But if I click on a cell that has a drawing in it, then that drawing's level becomes my current level, and then I can see the swatches and values for that level's styles. So by default, We've got two swatches in each level that we make. Uh, they appear to be black and white. The white color zero is technically transparent, indicated by these checkers at the bottom of its swatch, and it's basically locked as a null style. Then the black color one is automatically applied to our brush strokes when we're drawing in the level. So here we can see that black in the lines of our chicken. Our first goal is going to be to create a new style, change its color, and then use that as a fill for this chicken. So to start with, creating a new style, you can click on this button. It looks kind of like a post-it note, and if you hover over it, it says new style. If you take that approach, be careful that you don't click on the button right next to it, which would create a new page. Uh, very similar icon, but it has a folder tab, and that is not what we want. <clears throat> If you want to avoid that confusion, you can also just right click in the level palette and then choose new style on that list. Uh, either way, that should give us a new style called color two by default. And as we create new styles, it's a good habit to name them to keep things organized. So I'm going to double click where it says color two here. And since this is intended as a fill color for the body, I'm going to call it body fill and then hit enter to save that. A uh, little note on renaming, be sure to click directly on the text itself. If you double click slightly above or below, it opens up another panel of the style editor, which for us is redundant right now. So I'm going to close that down. And again, to rename, double click on the text itself. So by default, our new style comes in as a duplicate of whichever style we had selected previously. In this case, that means our body fill starts off as a duplicate of color one. We can change that over here in the style editor. Uh, what we've got over here are sliders and values for HSV, A for alpha or transparency, and then RGB. I'm gonna start with a medium brown for the body fill. And a quick way to achieve that is to give this style a fair amount of red, uh, medium green, and then I'll dial back the saturation a bit to end up with this kind of tan color. Uh, now that we've got this color, we're going to fill in the character with it, and for that we'll use the Fill tool. It's over here in the toolbar with this paint bucket icon, or you can also just tap the hot key F to switch over to the Fill tool. Uh, for starters, I'm going to try clicking with our new style selected within an enclosed shape here, and that gives us a fill for that enclosed shape. Uh, note that the shape really has to be enclosed, if I want to see what happens if that's not the case, if I tap E to switch to my eraser and break the line here so that our shape is no longer enclosed, then we lose our fill. Uh, without an enclosed shape here, if I try to use the fill tool again, I'm not gonna get a result. Uh, if you've got this kind of issue, you can fix it by using the control point editor. So here I'll use that to close this gap. Uh, in my case, that made the fill come back. Uh, I found that's not always consistent, but if it doesn't come back on its own, you should be able to use the fill tool again to just reapply it. Uh, another thing to note, up here at the comb, notice that our main body fill applied throughout the comb as well. Uh, my eventual goal is to have the main body its own color and then to have the comb uh, red instead, so I don't want this fill to apply throughout. A uh, knee-jerk reaction might be to tap E to use the eraser again and try to erase that fill away, but that's not going to work here. So this brings us to another point. 
in Tunes Vector Levels, the eraser tool does not work on fill areas. The fill is just a designation, basically saying that all the area within this enclosed shape should be filled with this style. So it's not something that we can erase pixel by pixel. Uh, in my case, that's also why the fill came back when I reestablished the enclosed shape here, because that designation for the fill was still in there. So if I want to not have the comb filled up here, instead of trying to erase that fill away, what I'm going to do is zoom in, tap C for my control point editor, and then I'm going to clean up my lines to make these two separate shapes here. And uh, that doesn't get rid of the fill just yet, so if I want this to go back to not having a fill, since I can't erase that away, what I'll do instead is select color zero, Remember that's locked as a null style, and then if I use the fill tool with that and fill in that enclosed shape with color zero, it basically wipes out the previous fill that we had applied. So now we're back to this not having a fill, and let's go ahead and create another style to use as our comb fill here. So again, I'm going to right click in the style editor and say new style. Uh, this time I'll double click where it says color three and call this the comb fill and I'll want this to be red for the comb, so over here in the style editor. Uh, this time I've already got red as an option since we're starting from white. More on that in just a second. So if I increase my saturation here, then I can get red for the comb fill. So now that we've done that, uh, we might hope that we can use this new styled fill in the comb. So with my fill tool selected, I'm going to try clicking within the comb but I'm not getting any result there. So it looks like nothing's happening. Uh, actually what's happening is this style is being used to fill in this area, but remember when we create a new style, it duplicates the previously selected style. And when I created the comb fill style here, I had color zero selected. Uh, remember that's transparent indicated by these checkers. So our comb fill style also came in as transparent since it's a duplication of color zero. So to fix that, over here in the style editor, I'll want to change the A value for alpha. Uh, zero means it's totally transparent, and I'll want to crank that up to be totally opaque here. And once we have opacity for that style, we can see now it's showing up in the comb. All right, so I'm gonna do this one more time for the beak. Uh, this time I'm going to have comb fill selected when I create a new style, and that means we don't have to worry about the transparency. Uh, I'm gonna double click on color four and call this beak fill, and then I'm just going to change the hue here to be orange, and we'll go with that as our beak fill. Uh, then, again with our fill tool, we'll click in the beak, and since that's already an enclosed shape, we're good to go there. <clears throat> and now, we've got our character fully colored in this first drawing. A uh, little thing to note, if we make any changes to these styles after already applying them as fills, then we can see those changes take effect on the character. So let's say uh, maybe I want my body fill to be slightly darker, uh, maybe a little bit less green than we've currently got on the chicken. For that, I can select body fill, I can take the value down a little bit, and I can increase the red. And as I'm making these changes to the style, uh, those changes again are going to show up anywhere I've got that style applied in the drawing. Uh, on that note, maybe for a little bit more contrast between the beak and the body fill, I'm going to try darkening down that body fill. I'll stop now. I could go on, but I mainly wanted to show that kind of tweaking as possible with the Open Tunes coloring system. So now I'm going to speed up the footage while I clean up the lines for my other two drawings, and then I'll apply those fills, and we end up with color throughout our simple animation loop. All right. Last thing to note, this palette applies to all the drawings in the same level, so that ability to edit our colors I was showing earlier will apply to all of these drawings as well. So if I were to take the body fill, and let's just try drastically changing the hue for our chicken here, and then hit L to see the animation again, uh, again, that change applies all throughout the animation. Now that I've done that, uh, I kind of like the purple, so let's go with that. <coughs> Now, let's say we want to get a little fancy and add some cell shading. First, I'm going to create a new style to serve as a shadow color for the chicken's main body here. And remember, when we create a new style, it starts as a duplicate of our previous selected style. So I'm going to make sure that I've got body fill selected as my current style, and then I'm going to make a new style based on that. Again, it comes in as a duplicate, and I'm going to rename this as body 
shadow. Then in the style editor, I'm going to darken this shadow color down a bit. I'll start by taking the value slider and decreasing that for a darker value. This is effectively like if you were working with paint, mixing a color with black to make it darker. And if you're familiar with color theory, you know we'll have more visual interest if we don't just stop at that. So I'm also going to bump up the saturation a bit and bump up the blue a little to make the shadow color a bit cooler. Uh, I think I might also darken it down just a bit more so we have more contrast for what I'm about to show. Ultimately, I'll probably lighten it back up, but for now we'll want that increased contrast. So once we've got our shadow color created, now for application, I'm going to tap B for the brush tool, and then I'm going to draw in a dividing line to delineate between the shadow area and the main fill area. Uh, note when I draw in this line, I do want it to intersect with my outlines. Uh, I don't want it to be too far in, which would mean we don't have enclosed spaces for the main fill and shadow areas. I uh, also don't want it to be too far out, because then it would look messy if it's going beyond our outlines here. So I'm going to make sure that the endpoints for my dividing line here are intersecting with the outlines. Uh, if we check the other end, looks like there's a little bit of cleanup to do there too. Uh, so now we've got the line placed where we want, but note we've also got this issue where it's overlapping with the outline a little bit and kind of appears to be eating into the outline's brushstroke. Uh, luckily, we can fix that. The way that OpenTunes handles brushstrokes in vector levels, it treats each stroke as its own individual asset. And the most recent stroke is kind of layered at the top of the stack of those assets, so that's why we've got our dividing line showing up on top of our outlines here. We can move this stroke to the back of the stack by selecting it and then using the hotkey control starting bracket to move it to the back of the strokes. And if you're curious, it doesn't have to stay that way. You can also use the hotkey control ending bracket to put it back on top. But if we want to move it to the back of the stack, again, that control starting bracket hotkey will achieve that. And now we've still got our dividing line in place and it's nestled underneath our outlines instead of overlapping on top. So now I'm going to switch back to my fill tool and apply the shadow fill in its area, and now we've got cell shading on our first drawing here. Uh, to make it a little bit more subtle, I'm going to bump up our value just a bit, and then if I repeat that same process for the other drawings, then ultimately we'll have this cell shading throughout our simple loop here. <clears throat> you might notice some wonkiness where some areas might lose their fills as you draw lines over them. To be honest, I don't have an explanation for why this behavior can vary so much, especially in these different takes with the same drawing here. Uh, for this demo, I wanted to start by showing a flat fill first, and then add shadows from there. Technically though, the best practice would be to draw your shadows dividing lines first, and then apply fills. Uh, if you do lose a fill along the way, generally you can just reapply it. But if you find the fill tool not working, stay tuned for settings and troubleshooting. <coughs> All right, as a final touch, let's try adding some color to the lines. This is totally optional, but for some aesthetics it can be an effective choice, so let's go over how to do it. First, since we've got this medium purple as our main fill color, let's try making all the lines a dark purple to go with that. So I'm going to select color 1, and then over in the style editor, to make this purple, I'll give it a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. Uh, now you can see anywhere that color 1 is applied, and that should be all of our brush strokes by default, we now have a subtle purple color. Uh, also note, since we made this change to color 1, which is the default brush color, if we switch to our brush tool and draw some new strokes, they'll automatically come in with that purple hue. Okay, so we'll wipe those out. And next up, let's say we want to keep the body lines purple, but for the comb up here, let's make these outlines dark red. So we'll zoom in a little closer, and we'll want the red for these lines to be like a darker version of the red fill here. So I'll select comb fill before creating my new style, and that means the new style comes in as a duplicate of that red. Let's go ahead and name this comb lines, and then to make this darker over in the style editor, I'm going to bring its value down, and then I'll crank the saturation way up. Okay. Now, there are a couple ways to apply this new style to these existing lines. Uh, what I'm going to show here is I'll tap S to switch to my select tool, and then I'll click on this brush stroke to select it. And then with the stroke selected, if I click on my comb line style, that will automatically apply it to my selected brush strokes. Uh, now that we've done that, it'll look a little bit neater if we don't have this overlap. So with this brush stroke selected, 
I'll hit that control starting bracket shortcut. That moves it to the back of the stack, and we're no longer seeing that overlap. <clears throat> All right. I should also note that with this new style selected, if I switch back to the brush tool and draw with that, we can draw new strokes with this color as well. And really, we could do new brush strokes with any of our styles available. Color 1 is the default brush stroke color, but it's not the only possible brush stroke color. Uh, that said, be aware, if I click away from this level and then click back on it and now draw a brush stroke again, uh, the new brush stroke defaults back to color one, no matter what I had selected a moment ago. So with that in mind, I recommend thinking of color one as your main color for lines, and then you can make other line styles as needed. So let's wipe these out. And now, if we pull back and look at our other two drawings, uh, note that the purple color has been applied throughout since uh, my changes to color one in this palette affect everything in this level, sharing this palette. I'm going to quickly apply the comb style and then move those strokes to the back. And once that's done, we've got colorful lines throughout the entire loop. <clears throat> so now we've got the basic tools to get started with color. You might have noticed with the fill tool, there were a bunch of settings and options at the top of the screen. We're going to take a closer look at those and that's coming up next. <clears throat> At this point, we've introduced how to create color styles and how to add them to an animation. And now let's take a closer look at the settings for the fill tool. These settings can help a lot with efficiency, especially if you've got a more complicated drawing with lots of separate areas to fill. <clears throat> so I've got an example file here with Thundercluck flapping his wings, and it is mostly colored in except for this last drawing, which is incomplete. So let's tap F to switch over to our fill tool and let's take a look at these tool settings up at the top of the screen. First up, we've got type. Uh, normal, as we've seen before, means that one click gives us one fill. So I'm going to switch to my gold fill style here, and with the type as normal, if I click once within the neck, then we get that single area filled in. If we want to check out the other options here, just like the select tool, we've got options for rectangular, freehand, and polyline. I'm going to switch to rectangular, and what this will let me do is fill in multiple areas within a selected range. So if I click and drag a marquee around this blank wing, then I can fill in all those shapes at once, saving a little bit of time. I'm going to undo that and make a special note here. Uh, be sure, if you're taking this approach, that your marquee fully encompasses all the shapes that you want to fill in. So this gives us a successful fill, but if I undo again and just click and drag within the shapes, I'm not going to get any result that way. So again, uh, make sure that your marquee fully encompasses the shapes that you want to fill if you're taking this approach. Okay, so that's type. I'm going to set that back to normal, and next up, mode is set to areas by default, and as we've seen so far, that means our fill tool works within the areas contained within our lines. Uh, we can change that to fill in the lines themselves, or to fill in both lines and areas. What I'm going to do is set this to lines, and notice I've got a slightly lighter color for the detail lines within the wings. I'm going to switch to that wing detail line style, and then with my type set to normal, I can click once to fill in lines one at a time, or I can change my type to one of the other options and get multiple lines at once. All right, so I'm going to set mode back to areas as it was by default. And next, let's take a look at this selective option. If this is unchecked, then we can fill in any area, whether it currently has a fill or not. But if it's checked, then our fill tool only affects areas that are not currently filled in. So on Thundercluck right now, the only areas left to fill are the waddles and the comb. It might look like the horns and the eye whites are still blank. Uh, technically, they have this slightly off-white fill already applied. So the waddles and the comb are left to fill. I'm going to switch to my red fill style, and with selective checked and my type rectangular, I can do a marquee selection around the entire character, and only those empty areas are going to be affected by that. Uh, by contrast, if selective were not checked, and I were to do that same rectangular selection, it would recolor the entire character, which is not what we want. So let's undo that. And this selective setting is especially useful when you're finishing up a coloring job and you've only got one style left to apply to multiple areas. For the onion skin setting, I'm going to revert back to not having any fills on this current drawing. And as I've said before, 
I'm not the biggest fan of having onion skin on, but I'll use it here for demonstration purposes. So now we can see a faint image of a previous drawing that's already colored in. And if we check onion skin, it can save us a little bit of time for switching between fill styles without having to click down in the palette because uh, anywhere an area on our current drawing overlaps with an area on that previous drawing that has the fill color we want, then we can click on that overlap and even though I don't currently have gold fill as my selected style, when I click on that overlap, it will auto-select that style to fill this area on our current level. So here where the wing is overlapping with some gold, I can click to fill that. Where the tail is overlapping, where the leg is overlapping, uh, these are all filling in with gold. And then if I click on the torso, where it's overlapping with the previous drawing's torso, then I'll get the brown there automatically without having to select it in the palette. And then we can go back to gold so on and so forth. <clears throat> to be completely honest, I don't use this setting all that often. Uh, for my taste, it adds a lot of visual clutter without adding that much more efficiency, but if you're curious what it does, there it is. And in case you find it useful, it's one more tool at your disposal. <clears throat> the frame range setting is really useful once you get it working, but it can be a bit temperamental. So I'm gonna show it working well first, and then I'll point out a few things to be aware of. So here I've got this example file with a bird sliding across the screen and coming to a stop. And to use the frame range fill, I'm going to stop playback, navigate to my first frame, make sure that my fill style is selected, and then I'll tap F to use my fill tool. And let's go ahead and check frame range. And with this checked, if I click inside the character where I want to fill, I'm not going to get a fill right away. Instead, I'm going to get an indicator for the start point of our frame range fill. Now if I navigate forward in the animation to about the end of that sliding motion and then click within the character again, now we're going to get a fill across that whole range of motion. So that is the frame range fill working well. Again, instead of one click for one fill, you click at the start point for a range of motion and then the end point for the range of motion. And if things are working well, the fill applies to the character all the way along. So again, that's what the setting can do. But a couple things to point out. Uh, for one thing, note over here in the X sheet, as we're looking at the numbers in our cells over here, uh, notice that they're going down in numerical order. And that is actually not the way that the cells were numbered when I first made this animation. That's something I had to apply manually uh, to make the frame range fill work. <clears throat> if we revert back to a previous version of this file, note that the motion is the same, but if we check the numbers in the X sheet over here, they're a little bit jumbled up. So just to clarify what these mean, the numbers on the left of the X sheet are the frame numbers of the animation. Uh, the numbers on the cells are the order in which I drew them, and that's the order that they're numbered in the level. So what this means is I first drew this first frame of the animation, and then I drew this last frame of the animation, and then I drew this in between, and so on. So these numbers are the order in which the cells were drawn, and if that doesn't match the playback order, it doesn't cause any problems for how the animation shows up. You can see here it's going just fine, but it does cause problems if we try to use the frame range fill option. So here just to demonstrate that, I'm going to go back to my first frame of the animation, got my fill tool selected, and I'm going to check frame range. And just like I did before, I'm going to click within the character here at the start of the motion and then navigate forward through my frames to the end of that motion. And if I try to click again, this time it only filled that first frame and that last frame. So this was not a successful use of this setting. <clears throat> to make that work, I'm going to undo here, and then we need to renumber our drawings so that these numbers are in order. To do that, I'm going to click on my first cell here, then hold Shift and click at the end to select all of my cells and then I'm going to right click on that selection and choose auto renumber about a third of the way down the list. So you might have seen a little pop over here in the level strip as these drawings are being renumbered and now our drawing numbers are ordered based on their playback arrangement. So now that I've made that change, once again with feeling I'm going to try to use this frame range fill. We'll start at the first frame of this motion, set that start point there, and then I'll navigate forward to the end of that motion and this time I got that successful fill again. Okay, so again, make sure that your frames are numbered in order over in the X sheet. The other thing to keep in mind with the frame range setting is that it works best if the character is either static 
or moving at a steady speed, but it doesn't work as well if there's a change in speed or direction. Uh, so here, at the end of the slide when the character slows down, notice that it's no longer moving forward. It's going to work best if I fill this in as a separate frame range from that initial slide. If I were to try to go from the very start here to the very end here, that change in speed would throw things off. But instead, if I treat this as one frame range to fill in, and then treat this as a second frame range, <clears throat> then ultimately I'll have the entire sequence filled in. <clears throat> Finally, maximum gap will determine how much of a break you can have in your lines and still have the fill tool work. So to demonstrate that, here I've got a drawing of Baby Thundercluck, and I have intentionally left just a tiny little gap in the lines over the wing in this area. So if we zoom back out, I'm going to use my fill tool and demonstrate if I take maximum gap and set it all the way down, the lowest it'll go is 0.01, then that tiny little gap is going to prevent the fill tool from working. But if we set the max gap back up a bit, I believe 1.15 is the default there. Then if I try to use the fill tool again, uh, success. I wouldn't necessarily rely on this. Uh, generally try to keep your lines as clean as possible, but it can be useful to know it's there. Uh, also, a little bit of trivia, after a fill has been applied, if it's relying on maximum gap, if you bring max gap back down, sometimes you can lose your fill after the fact. So be careful with that. And with that in mind, if you're aware of a gap in your lines, my recommendation is to use the control point editor to clean them up and that should keep your fills more stable. <clears throat> that max gap setting will come into play in our next section on color troubleshooting. This is going to include a lot that I wish I had known earlier on, and I hope that you find it helpful. That's coming up next. <clears throat> Coloring in open tunes can be a lot of fun when everything's working well, but every once in a while issues come up. The most common ones that I've encountered are when the level palette won't make a new style, when a new style is visible in the palette, but not in the viewer, when the fill tool doesn't fill, and finally, when colors seem to just vanish from the level palette. For some of these, we'll do a little recap. For some, we'll show some new techniques, and for some, we'll even see some odd behavior in the program. So let's start from the top of this list with the level palette not making a new style. <clears throat> so here we've got this drawing of Thundercluck. Looking about the way that I feel about technical difficulties and down here in the level palette, if I click on the new style button, I'm not getting any results there. So a couple clues to notice right off the bat. Uh, the level palette says no styles and the level strip says no current level. Uh, remember, we need to have a current level selected in order to work with that level's colors. And what's happened here is at some point I clicked on a blank cell that didn't have any content in it. So we don't have a current level selected. Uh, if I click on this cell that has our drawing in it, then note we've got a current level now and we can see the swatches for that level. So at this point, I could click on this new style button and that would successfully give us a new style. But the other thing to keep in mind is this new page button right next door uh, looks awful similar. I mentioned it before and let's take a closer look at it now. If we click on that by accident, we're not gonna get a new style. You might notice each time we click that, we've gotten another tab here in the level palette. Uh, if you don't notice that happening and you just rapid fire, click, 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 Watch out, sometimes you'll end up with a lot of tabs without realizing it, and that doesn't do any harm, but it can feel disorganized. So these tabs uh, would allow us to organize our palette styles into categories, which could be useful. Uh, we could sort styles into these, for example, if we had multiple characters in a level and each one needed its own collection of colors. But if that's not the case here, uh, if we just want to keep all of our level styles under this default colors tab, then we don't need these additional pages. So if you've created some by accident, you can always just right click on the tab and choose delete page to get rid of it. Again, pages can be useful if you intentionally want them, but if you create them by accident, it's best to wipe them out so you don't have a bunch of extra clutter here. Okay, now that we've got all that covered, I could either use the new style button to make a new style as desired, or if I want to avoid that button confusion, Again, another option is to just right click and choose new style there. All right, next up, let's talk about when a new style is visible in the palette, but not in the viewer. So back to Thundercluck here, we've got our color two that I just created, and let's say I want to make this red to fill in the waddles and comb. 
So with color 2 selected, over here in the style editor, I'm just going to take my saturation slider and crank it on up. Looks like that's already giving us a red hue, so let's start with that. And I'm going to double click, again, good organization habits, and we'll call this red fill. And then I'll tap F to switch to my fill tool. I'm going to click on the comb to fill it in, and I'm not getting any result. Uh, so there are a number of reasons the fill tool might not be filling. Uh, we'll talk about more in a second, but one more thing I want to show here. If I tap B for my brush tool and then try to draw a line, we can see that line kind of show up for a second, but then it's gone. So the issue here isn't just that the fill tool isn't filling, but this style isn't showing up at all in the viewer. And the reason for that is the style's transparency. So again, little recap from our intro. Notice these checkers down at the bottom of the swatch. Uh, when we created this new style, it came in as a clone of color zero, which means it inherited color zero's transparency. Uh, also, if we look in the style editor, we'll see that the A value for alpha is at zero. So if we take the slider and drag it all the way up, or if you manually click on this value and enter its max 255, now we've got full opacity for our style again. Uh, we can see the fill on our comb, and we can also see that line we tried to draw earlier with the brush tool. Since we don't want that line, I'm gonna tap S for my select tool, select the line, tap delete to wipe it out, and to finish the job, we'll tap F for the fill tool, fill in the waddles, and now we're ready to move on. So next, let's talk about more reasons why the fill tool might not fill. Uh, moving on with our example here, I've created another style to use as a gold fill in the neck and head area. Got that style selected, got my fill tool active, but if I click on the neck, I'm not getting a fill there. So first up, let's check on that transparency. Not seeing any checkers in the swatch. The alpha value is all the way up, so that's not the issue. Another thing to check is your settings. So since this is an area that I want to fill, I want to make sure my fill tools mode is set to areas. Then also want to make sure that selective, onion skin, and frame range are all unchecked unless I specifically want any of those. So if your transparency and your fill settings are all good to go and you're still not getting a fill, the issue is probably that OpenTunes is detecting a gap in the lines so the shape isn't considered enclosed. And that means it won't fill. In this case, let's in on a little secret here. Uh, we could close this gap up by editing the lines and that would solve our issue. I'll show that in a second. But one other thing I want to demonstrate here, if we click on view and then fill check, this can be useful for previewing which shapes are eligible to fill. So we saw some things become gray here. That's not actually changing the color of these areas. If we were to export this animation, it wouldn't come out gray like this. Uh, the gray is just a preview to let us know what areas can be filled. So with fill check selected, we can see that the helmet, the comb, the waddles, and the eyes are all eligible to fill, but not the neck and the head area. And again, that's because of the gap. <coughs> One other interesting thing to note here, if we adjust the fill tool's max gap setting, at some point there's a threshold where that area is considered either enclosed or not enclosed, depending on how much of a gap OpenTunes will allow on the lines. So if max gap is high enough that this area is considered enclosed, then we can turn off our fill check by clicking view and unchecking fill check. Uh, now with that off, we can see the actual colors of our drawing and with the gold fill selected, and the fill tool active. Now if we click on the neck, we'll get a successful fill there. So that max gap can be a quick fix for tiny gaps if you don't want to edit your lines. Uh, but if I don't want to rely on max gap, my other option is to get in nice and close here, tap C for the control point editor and adjust the lines. And now the shape is fully enclosed. Now if we zoom back out and apply a fill, since we've made sure that the shape was actually enclosed, that'll remain stable no matter what our max gap setting is. So I'm just going to set that back to the default 1.15. <clears throat> that said, every once in a while there's a case where a shape appears to be totally enclosed, but OpenTunes perceives it as having a gap, and changing settings doesn't seem to help. This can be unpredictable, so for this tutorial I was planning on just faking it, basically, and pretending there was an area I couldn't fill. Uh, but it happened for real with Grumpy Thundercluck here. Uh, so I've moved ahead with my styles and fills, and everything was going great until I got to this last eye area. But with my blue fill style selected and my fill tool active, if I tried to click on that area, I'm not getting any result. Uh, weirdest thing, if I click on View, Fill Check, uh, a moment ago, that area was previewed in gray as good to go, but now with the fill check activated, 
for whatever reason, that area is no longer considered eligible to fill. Uh, as far as I can tell, this kind of inconsistency is just a bug in the program. I think that's why some people prefer coloring with raster levels, which we might talk about in a future section. Uh, but sticking with vectors here, this is an ideal, but fortunately there's a workaround. I'm going to click View and turn Fill Check back off, and since this area is not responding to the Fill tool, what I'm going to try is I'll tap B for my brush tool, and then with a single brush stroke, I'm going to draw around the perimeter of that shape. Uh, I tend to find that OpenTunes does a better job of recognizing shapes as enclosed if they're drawn with a single stroke like this. So with that done, we'll try the Fill tool again, and now we've got it filled in. So the issue now is if we pull back a little bit, this eye is looking pretty different from this one because that new brush stroke we drew is layered on top of the previous outlines, and those outlines are what we actually want on top there. Uh, what we can do to fix that is tap S for the Select tool and then click to select that brush stroke. And as we talked about in the cell shading section, if we hit Control, starting bracket, then we can move that brush stroke to the bottom of the stack for this layer. So again, it's not ideal when this kind of situation comes up. Uh, Thundercluck doesn't look too happy about it, but with that workaround, we can still get to the desired end result. And for the record, if anybody has any idea what might be causing this kind of issue other than a bug, I am all ears. Uh, any input would be welcome there. <clears throat> couple bonus notes here. Uh, I've reverted back to a previous version of this file because after doing that last take, I read a couple other tips to try in this kind of situation. One was to just close and reopen the file, and the other was to try grouping your brush strokes. So I'm going to show real quick what I found trying those out. Uh, for closing and reopening the file, not a guarantee, but that actually did seem to help here, because now if I try to apply the fill, it's working without any of that uh, trickery I was showing earlier. Out of curiosity, I also wanted to see what would happen with grouping brush strokes, so I'm going to undo that fill, tap S to switch to my select tool, and I'm going to select the two brush strokes around the area in question here. And if I right click and choose group, kind of step in the wrong direction here, we lost our gold fill for the main neck and head area. Uh, if I switch to my gold fill style and try to reapply that, I'm not getting any result now. Uh, I'm going to try hitting control Z to undo and <laughs> Uh, we got our gold fill back, but now it's gone into the eye. Looks kind of like Thundercluck's got some jaundice going on here. Uh, I can reapply my eye white fill, but now if I switch back to my blue fill, now this area has gone back to not fillable. Uh, in a future video, we'll talk about what grouping means and why it affects fills, but for now, I'm not finding it to be a reliable fix when the fill tool isn't working. So, my recommendation when this issue comes up would be to try closing and reopening the file, and if that doesn't work, try the single brush stroke approach I was showing earlier. And if anybody does have better luck with grouping brush strokes, again, any input here is welcome. <clears throat> Alright, now let's talk about when colors become unavailable. This happened to me a lot early on, back before I understood the importance of level management. So let's go back to a work in progress version of that flap animation. And as I scrub through the frames, the colors are all there and looking good until we get here. And not only is this drawing not colored in, but its level palette doesn't have the styles that we could see in our previous drawings. So a couple things to keep in mind for why this happens. Uh, first, note over here in the X sheet, all these drawings are in the same column, but that doesn't mean they're in the same level. Uh, remember, columns are just how content is arranged in the X sheet, while levels are collections of drawings that share the same palette, regardless of column. So, all these previous drawings were together in a level called Color V2, and they all shared that desired palette, but the drawing we're having the issue with is off in its own level, which appears to have been automatically created with the name F, and that level's palette does not have the colors that we want. So, as a reminder for how this happens, I'm going to rewind and show an excerpt from the previous section on the X sheet and creating new frames. Remember earlier when I made a new frame, I made sure to click on this X and draw within that. Uh, that created a new drawing in our current level, which is what we want. We want all of those drawings organized together. You can click on any of these cells and start drawing, but watch the level strip when I do this. If I start drawing here, it's not in the same level as the other drawings we were doing. So. Uh, try not to do that. But if you do end up with an accidental level, there are a couple options to resolve the issue. <clears throat> uh, 
the quick fix is to just copy and paste the styles that we want from our original level into our accidental level. So to do that, I'm going to navigate to a drawing that has the styles we want. Then I'm going to click to make sure color one is selected, press and hold shift and click on the last style in the level palette. Uh, this should select all the styles in the palette. And then if I right click on those styles and choose copy, then navigate to my drawing that's missing the styles, I can right click and choose paste insert. And now this level will have those styles. Uh, by the way, Control c Control v will also work for that, but if you use that, be sure to click in the level palette beforehand so OpenTunes knows to copy the swatches, not the drawing. Uh, so, now that we've got those styles in this level, I can go ahead and apply them to the drawing, and once those styles are applied, even though this drawing is technically in its own separate level, it appears to fit right in with the rest of the frames. Uh, now, even though this method feels pretty straightforward, it does have a drawback. Uh, let's say once I've got everything colored in, you know what, I want Thundercluck's vest and helmet to be a little bit darker. So I'm going to select this brown fill style, and then I'll decrease its value to darken it down. Uh, now if I check the rest of the animation, that change should apply throughout all these drawings that are in the same level, sharing the same palette, uh, but it does not apply to our drawing that's in a separate level. And if we toggle back and forth between our frames, we'll see a discrepancy here that would cause a little flicker in the animation. We can fix this by navigating back to one of the previous frames, selecting that brown fill style, making a note of the number for its value field, then going to our separate level drawing, selecting brown fill, and making that number match. But this process is tedious, especially if you have to do it across multiple frames. So, even though copying and pasting the palette can feel easy at first, it can cause issues down the line. <clears throat> Our second option here takes a little more effort up front, but can keep things more organized in the long run, and that is to transfer the drawing from our accidental level back into the original level. So to do that, I've reverted back to our drawing not having the desired colors, and I'm going to select the two cells that are in that accidental level, then I'll click on the bar on the side of the cells, and drag over sideways to move them to a separate column. So once I've done that, I'm going to want to copy the line work here from the cells and paste it into a new cell, and that'll be a new drawing within our original level that has the desired palette. So I'm going to click on my cell with the line work that I want. I'm going to tap S to use a select tool, and then I'm going to do a marquee around my entire character here. Uh, make sure that you are selecting the lines so you can see the little dotted line selection for this content. Uh, you don't want to just select the cell in the X sheet. So with that line work selected, if I hit Control C, that'll copy it to the clipboard. And then for a little more visual clarity when I paste this, I'm going to turn off visibility for this second column in my X sheet. So over here in the X sheet, note up at the top under Call 2 for the second column, there's a little icon that looks like a circle with a square inside it. That's going to toggle the visibility in our viewer here. So if I click that, this level is no longer visible here, but those lines are still copied to my clipboard. Uh, now, if I go over to this X under my previous frames in column one, then hit Control V to paste, that'll paste these lines into a new drawing in this original level with the desired palette. So now, with the cell selected, we're seeing our other drawings in the level strip and our colors in the level palette. Uh, so, now that we've got that line work in place, I'm going to go ahead and color it in. <clears throat> and once that's all filled in, now this drawing fits right in with the other drawings on the same level and shares the same palette. So, now that we've come this far, just a little bit of tidying up to do. Uh, for one thing, note we've got a redundant color 1 that came into this level when we pasted the content from our other level because those lines had the flat black color 1 applied. Since this isn't part of the final palette, we can go ahead and select that and hit delete. And this warning comes up, basically saying that the color is or might still be in use. Uh, it's a little odd because I'm pretty confident I replaced all uses of that pasted color one, but maybe there's a small dot somewhere that still has it applied. Uh, to keep things moving here, I'm just gonna choose delete styles only to make sure I don't delete anything else by accident. And that wipes out the redundant color one. <coughs> Then a little more cleanup to do in the X sheet. Uh, since we only pasted the drawing into this single cell, I'll need to click on the blank cell below it and then right click and choose fill in empty cells. And then we've still got our old cells from the drawing in the accidental level over in column two here. Uh, if we click to toggle visibility, you can see it's still there. Since we no longer need these cells, we can go ahead and select them and hit delete to wipe them out as well. 
And once we've done all that, then we've got this drawing added to the original level and sharing its palette. So if I wanted to make any further changes to color, for example, if I wanted to change the eyes, then that change would apply throughout the entire animation without having to edit any frames individually. All right. <clears throat> Confusion with color styles is one of many reasons to be extra careful about level management in OpenTunes. With that in mind, I want to demo not only how to work with multiple levels, but also some changes we can make to the OpenTunes interface to help keep those levels organized. So that's coming up next. I hope you find these videos helpful, and if so, subscribe for more tutorials and check out thundercluck.com, especially if you have any young readers or fans of animation in your life. Thanks for watching.